The Tom Woods Show, episode 467. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey, everybody. Tom Woods here. Delighted to be joined once again by Larry Reed, president of the Foundation for Economic Education. He's the editor of a new book with the delicious title, Excuse Me, Professor, Challenging the Myths of Progressivism. The book appears just in time for Back to School. I wonder if Regnery was thinking about that when they released it, but it's just great. The timing, the content, it's all great. It's easily absorbed and digested. It's a whole bunch of tiny little chapters, but that are filled with great arguments and valuable information. Larry, welcome back to the show. Hey, thank you very much, Tom. It's a pleasure. I love the title of this book, Excuse Me, Professor, as the main title of the book, <laughs> and it, it, that's just fantastic. I love it. And I hope, as we said before we went on, that there will be a bunch of students who will indeed say, Excuse Me, Professor, after reading this book. Before we get into the meat of it, tell me, is this an outgrowth of the old classic by Fee, first cliches of socialism and then cliches of politics. Yes, it is. Uh, those were two influential books. Uh, I loved them. In fact, the uh, first one, Cliches of Socialism, came out in 1962, and it was one of the first things I read when I got involved in the uh, movement for liberty. And, and in fact, I've drawn uh, several chapters for this new book from those two earlier ones. Uh, they required a little bit of updating, but the principles are still there. So uh, we, we've got a little taste of those two earlier classics in this new one. It's interesting. Of course, you do find some items that are no longer really all that relevant. It's, it's, it's like reading Hayek's Road to Serfdom, where he's talking about a world in which people are – a lot of people think there ought to be state ownership of the means of production. They, they, you don't find that really so much anymore. But what is more interesting to me is just how many of these questions we're still answering, and they go on as if we've never said a word. But we have been answering them over and over and over again. But I, I will say I was pleased to see in here, because I bet it's been one of your most popular articles over the years, the treatment of – I think you know where I'm going – Upton Sinclair's book, The Jungle. Yes. I get so many college kids and high school kids writing to me saying, what do I say about Upton Sinclair, right? Doesn't this show that we'd all be poisoned to death if we had a free market economy? I want you to take your time and lay out for us how we should think about that matter of Upton Sinclair and his book, The Jungle. And, and by the way, remember that about 17% of our audience is, is uh, international, so they may not know what the book is about. Okay. Well, the book uh, by Upton Sinclair called The Jungle came out very early in the last century, and it uh, was first serialized in a magazine published by the Socialist Party, and then later put together in a book uh, called The Jungle. And it rather quickly created a sensation, uh, largely because of fewer than a dozen pages in which purported to describe conditions in the meatpacking plants in Chicago. And uh, as the book describes them, of course, they were horrendous. Uh, uh, people falling into the vats and being ground up with, uh, with meat and, and sold as sausage or Durham's pure leaf lard <laughs> and that kind of thing. Just horrendous conditions. Well, it turns out that even though it was accepted by so many people, propagandists in particular, as gospel, uh, it was rooted in myth and misconception and propaganda. The book was written by Upton Sinclair uh, because he was paid $500 by uh, the socialists to write a tract or a book uh, that uh, made a case for socialism. And so he had to smear capitalism with all the uh, uh, vitriol that he could muster. And he hardly spent any time at all in the meatpacking plants. This is all f fiction. In fact, you have to wonder, as I mentioned in uh, the chapter in the, uh, in the book, you have to wonder if the stories about people, workers in particular, falling into those vats were true, 
Well, who were those people? I mean, they would be folk heroes to the left today, <laughs> you know, martyrs to the cause. And we'd all know their names. It'd be statues to, to the men who fell in those vats and were ground up as uh, and sold as meat. But, of course, nobody can give any names. That, that is an excellent point. I never thought of that. Yeah, you, well, we would know these people. Yeah, you'd think somebody would have said, hey, what happened to Bob? You know, or, hey, Jim didn't come home from work uh, <laughs> today. <laughs> but this sure is a delicious sausage I'm having. I'm so, I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, I mean, I don't yeah. mean to make light of it, but that's what we're told in school, yeah. right? I mean, it's not. I'm not making this stuff up. That's right. Like we all had Bob for supper, literally. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, really. And nobody ever asked, well, what happened to him? Or I mean, you'd have lawsuits uh, galore, and the the family. Or some mention in the newspaper, something, yeah. right? Somebody would find that newsworthy. Exactly, but nobody ever asks. You know what? In fact, when I first did the research on this, that's one thing I was looking for. I wanted to find out who were these guys. <laughs> and, of course, there were none. Well, another myth related to this is that there wasn't any government meat inspection before Upton Sinclair wrote his book, and then uh, which led in turn to the Meat Inspection Act of 1906. There was government meat inspection, federal, state, and local. And as they pointed out in uh, congressional hearings over the Meat Inspection Act of 1906, what does that say about the inspection that was already in existence? Either the government inspectors were asleep at the switch uh, or uh, corrupted in some way, or these stories that Sinclair wrote up were in fact total fiction. Even Teddy Roosevelt uh, attacked uh, Upton Sinclair as a liar, and I quote him in the book uh, as pointing out that almost nothing he wrote was actually true. And in the end, when the Meat Inspection Act of 06 passed, it enjoyed the support of the meat packers themselves because they saw the uh, uh, imprimatur of the federal government being stamped on their uh, product as uh, helping them recover lost markets because of Sinclair's propaganda. But more importantly, uh, that bill took the uh, meat packers off the hook for paying for the inspection and certification of their own processes and instead shifted the, the, the bill to the taxpayers. So they said, sure, we're for this. <laughs> but that idiot uh, Upton Sinclair gets credited with somehow exposing conditions that weren't even a uh, fact at all. It's all myth. It's all fiction. All right. So that's reason number one to get, excuse me, professor, but there are, how many questions? Are, are there 50 or so? I haven't got it in front of me. 52 chapters, So, uh, and some of the chapters deal with more than one progressive myth, uh, but we pick them apart across 52 chapters, lots of myths and misconceptions. Yeah, I was as I was looking through it last night, I was wondering if my 12-year-old would be ready to be able to dive into some of it. And I think some of it she probably could, because she yeah. certainly hears me talking about some of these progressive ideas quite a bit. And the the, the table of contents is just so juicy. You think, oh my gosh, that maybe this is the only book I ever need. It's really something else. Let, let's talk, let's skip ahead to chapter, let's see, 34. This is government as an inflation fighter. Is government an innocent bystander or an actual inflation fighter? Or is the truth something else altogether? That is the general view that people have. Uh, certainly they would either think that Inflation is just a fact of nature, so it really has nothing to do with government one way or the other. Or maybe they think that the government or its central bank is genuinely trying to fight back against price increases coming from the greedy people in the private sector. Yeah. Now, I bet you a lot of my listeners know the answer to this, but I am getting new people tuning in all the time, and it it's a good refresher anyway to show what really sound analysis would tell us about this question. Okay. You know, years ago, uh, Tom, I, I heard uh, former Congressman Jack Kemp quoting the head of the Federal Reserve at that time, or no, the Treasury Secretary, Michael Blumenthal, under Jimmy Carter. And apparently he was asked at a press conference what he thought inflation was and where it came from. And Blumenthal reportedly said, inflation is caused by many, many different things, all of which are acting and interacting in strange and mysterious ways. <laughs> <laughs> and my my point in raising that is, you know, politicians have a vested interest in making you think that inflation is this mysterious force. Who knows where it comes from? But they're on the job. They're fighting it. And, and if it uh, threatens us in any way, government will come in and do what it takes to stop it. But government itself is the inflation factory. It's not an inflation fighter. Inflation is an increase in the quantity of money and credit. 
Uh, and as Mises said, uh, an inf- increase in the quantity of money and credit beyond the increase in demand for it. Um, whichever definition y- you use, you have to realize that it, to determine where it comes from, you have to ask, well, who's producing it? And of course, the monetary authorities, the Federal Reserve in this country, are at the top of that food chain. And uh, they, through their regulation of interest rates, reserve requirements, money supply, credit supply, uh, and their command of the banking system, they determine money and credit and its general direction up or down and by how much. So you can't blame consumers. You can't blame business people when prices go up because uh, rising prices is simply a symptom of inflation. It's one of the things that you get when you first have the inflation, which is an increase in the supply of money and credit. Well, they'll sometimes pick out some really important commodity like oil, and they'll say there's a cost-push inflation going on, that everybody needs oil, so if the price of oil goes up, the price of everything else goes up. But the problem with that thinking is that if I now have to spend more money on oil, what does that leave me with? Less money to spend on other things. So there's a correspondingly downward pressure on other prices, so it's a wash. Yeah, exactly. So that doesn't raise all prices. That's right, and you see the same thing with, say, seasonal fruits and vegetables. You know, when at harvest time, everything is uh, ripe, being picked and brought to market, prices are down. But uh, in the dead of winter, when there's less of it or it has to come from a further distance, prices go up. An increase in the price of one or a few things is not inflation. Uh, And even if it's even if you have an increase in prices across the board, again, that's still not inflation. That's a symptom of it. You get rising prices pretty much across the board when you first get an increase in the supply of money and credit, which causes a decline in the value of any one unit. And that shows up in rising prices. Let's go ahead to, I'm going to skip around. I might might skip backward too. Chapter 43, though, covers a topic that I think even a lot of free market people have some trouble answering, and they kind of hope people won't bring it up, and that's education. Now, these days with the internet and and educational cost-cutting, it's a little bit easier to make a plausible case for free market education. But it seems like it's such a big expense. How could people of limited means possibly afford it without government assistance? Well, you know, you'd be amazed at what people can afford, even the poorest of people, especially when the government is offering them a lousy alternative at far higher cost. We're seeing that now in a lot of third world countries. Uh, The Economist magazine had a great piece on its cover just uh, within the last issue or two about the rise of $1 a day schools in the most difficult of places, places like rural India, where government or public schools are so bad and so costly that the poorest of people are fed up with them and creating their own schools. And they're performing and they're accommodating the poorest of kids who uh, are often paying no more than a dollar a day. Uh, so uh, we, ha- we really ought to be asking, asking ourselves, how can a system that tends to monopolize, to assign people their school according to their zip code, and then become unionized by political entities today, organized labor, teacher unions are so politicized, and then so bureaucratized, how on earth can such a system provide a quality education? It doesn't. There are millions falling through the cracks uh, in this country, through the public school system cracks every year. They tend to be in inner cities among the poorest of people. So uh, it's not as though government schools are already doing a good job and it's hard to see how the private sector could compete. Government schools are doing a lousy job at terrific expense and private alternatives are cropping up everywhere they're permitted. I actually did a couple of episodes on that. I had uh, James Tooley and I had Pauline Dixon, who have both done research on mm-hmm. this. I'll, I'll link to those episodes at tomwoods.com slash 467. Of course, I'm also going to link to the book there as well, and also to the previous couple of times that you've been on the show. On the education front, there's also a lack of creativity, I think, in people's minds, lack of imagination. Everybody thinks that education must be delivered in one particular way, and it's 12 years or 13 years of sitting in this type of classroom, then for four more years you sit in that type of classroom, but I'm always 
talking about on this show all these different inexpensive ways to acquire really valuable skills. Like, for example, to become a web developer, there are sites that I've promoted on the show that you can go and for $29 a month, you can learn a skill that can make you a very, very substantial salary. That's right. $29 a month. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that technology, uh, the internet, uh, some terrific low-cost options that are appearing now are, are going to serve to remind us of some things we never should have forgotten. And one of those things we shouldn't have forgotten is that the best education is individualized education. Uh, that's why homeschools succeed so well, because the focus is on each particular individual, igniting a lust for learning, giving them the opportunity to develop that on their own, uh, rather than sit in some classroom uh, that really looks more like a prison sometimes, and then be fed this one-size-fits-all pre-programmed, top-down, mandated, uh, teach-to-the-test kind of stuff that you get in government schools. Larry, let's pause just a moment for this message. Hey, everybody, there's nothing strictly wrong with wanting to be paid for doing absolutely nothing. What's wrong with that is when you want to take tax money for doing it. But it turns out that Ebates will pay you for doing pretty much nothing. I've just joined it, and it's a wonderful little program because i I shop online all the time, and it gives me free rebates for just existing. And you don't have to do this, but I installed the little Ebates button on my browser, and it alerts me when I'm at a vendor where I can get cash back for pretty much just existing. It's a ridiculous program, really. It's money that's just sitting on the table that you might as well grab. Check it out through TomWoods.com slash Ebates. And they're going to sweeten the deal with a free $10 gift card. TomWoods.com slash Ebates. You can earn money for doing absolutely nothing and do it morally. Let's see what else we can cover here. Yeah, let's do this because I, I remember reading your article on this subject, which got me to read the original article on this subject. The old question, maybe you're tired of talking about it, but <laughs> that's just too bad. <laughs> the question of Standard Oil and John D. Rockefeller. What was the real story there? And also, the other question, did he use so-called predatory price cutting to get to where he was? And, and in answering this question, you point out this article by John S. McGee from the 1950s that really did definitively answer that question. Absolutely. Well, I never get tired of talking about this, Tom. I'm glad you, oh, that's good. Glad you raised it. Uh, this is one of the great uh, myths of, uh, of, of progressivism that Standard Oil and its founder, John D. Rockefeller, were evil monopolists, uh, and they did what they did because they wanted to make money as if that's somehow sinful. But, of course, uh, John D. Rockefeller was not born with a silver spoon in his mouth. He was a bookkeeper and a grocer uh, and uh, had to save his money. He started an oil firm in 1865. Five years later, formed it, reformed it into the Standard Oil Company. And in his first year, he refined about 4% of, uh, of the oil market into kerosene uh, to replace uh, uh, whale oil. Uh, nobody in history has done more to save the whales, by the way, than John D. Rockefeller, because whale oil uh, preceded kerosene. It was increasingly scarce. We had to find an alternative, and Rockefeller did more than anybody to develop kerosene as an alternative to whale oil. Well, within 20 years of founding the Standard Oil Company by 1890, uh, he had about 90 percent of the oil uh, refined oil market. But he didn't get that way. He didn't get that large because he restricted output and raised price. He flooded the world with uh, uh, crude oil products, with kerosene in particular, and brought the price down from a high of about 46 cents um, uh, uh, per uh, gallon uh, to about 3 cents a gallon. And all during the time that he was growing – uh, Standard Oil, there were competitors. In fact, even at 90% market share, he still faced about 66 other competitors. They were all very tiny and only uh, made up about 10% of the market. But among them were companies that a few years later would be major challengers to him. And the charge that you mentioned of predatory price cutting, this is the idea that, uh, well, he got big because uh, he slashed his prices, drove the little guys out of business, and then in a market devoid of competition, he raised his prices, not just back to where they were before, but to some point even higher to cash in 
on uh, having won the price war. This is one of those easier said than done things. He never did it. John McGee, in his October 1958 article that I cite in the book, uh, uh, explained that whatever you may fault Rockefeller for, don't fault him for being stupid because he wasn't. And it, he would have been stupid to even try this. Uh, first of all, to slash your price uh, means that for a time at least, you're going to uh, sacrifice profit opportunities, probably incur a loss. Um, even if you can drive everybody else out of the market, the moment you start to raise your price again, you send a signal to newcomers or the old guys or even a brand new giant firm in another business that now's the time to come back in. You'd be forever keeping your price down in an effort to uh, prevent other guys from uh, ever competing with you. In a related field, if I could tell you the story real quick of uh, Herbert Henry Dow, uh, this really underscores how silly the predatory price cutting charge is. Herbert Henry Dow, about the same time that Rockefeller was in oil, uh, he started a chemical company, uh, the Dow Chemical Company, making bromine. At that time, the Germans dominated the bromine market. There was a German cartel with government subsidies. They were selling bromine at about 36 cents a pound. And Dow developed a process whereby he could sell it for less than that and uh, make a profit. And the Germans decided, well, we're going to run him out of business. So they dro drove the price down to 15 cents a pound, thinking it would run him out of business. But all he did was to have agents buy up all the 15 cent bromine that those dummies in Germany would make. He repackaged it and put his name on it and sold it for a profit wherever the uh, uh, cartel price was higher. And so finally, the German cartel had to throw in the towel. They kept wondering, where's all this demand coming from? Well, it was coming from... Uh, Dow himself, who was buying their dirt cheap bromine, turning it around and <laughs> selling it at a profit. So this charge didn't stick to uh, Rockefeller any better than it ever stuck to Herbert Henry Dow. Yeah, I'm looking at another one of your questions here. Uh, this one is so common. It's so common that, I don't know, I guess a lot of these are really common. It really yeah. frustrates me because <laughs> we've really, how are there still people who are teaching the wrong thing about Franklin Roosevelt and Herbert Hoover at this point. Like, e even even PBS did a thing saying Hoover was a progressive. Yeah. You know, like th that's, when they acknowledge that, the debate is over, and yet we still have this issue, and you have a question in here in the book on, did FDR run on a progressive platform against a laissez-faire Hoover? Well, given that his vice presidential nominee said that Hoover was driving the country down the path to socialism, I would say no. <laughs> and you would be exactly right. Uh, in the 1932 campaign, Franklin Roosevelt, the Democrat nominee, along with his uh, running mate, John Nance Garner, campaigned against Hoover uh, for raising taxes, raising tariffs, raising spending, tinkering with the economy. The Democratic pl Party platform on which Roosevelt and Garner ran called for a 25% reduction in federal spending. Uh, Roosevelt himself referred to Hoover as presiding over the greatest taxing and spending administration in American history. And he was right. Hoover, uh, you know, when he came into office, uh, uh, he, he uh, immediately began spending money like crazy. When the Depression hit, he ramps it up even further. He had his reconstruction finance corporation throwing corporate subsidies around. He jawboned businesses to keep wage rates high, even though prices were tumbling in the early 30s. And then he uh, closed the border practically to trade by signing the Smoot-Hawley tariff into law in 1930. And in 32, Hoover signed into law the Revenue Act, which doubled the income tax. So he was hardly a laissez-faire, stand pat, do-nothing president. He was he was uh, all over the place with intrusive, uh, big spending, big taxing government, and Roosevelt attacked him for that very thing. But the moment he took office in 1933, Roosevelt uh, uh, did precisely the opposite of what he promised and just did what Hoover did times 10. Let me read for people just a few of the questions that are asked and answered in this book to give them a taste of what they can expect. So right away, realizing just how hot the income inequality question is, you start with number one. 
Income inequality arises from market forces and requires government intervention. These are the kinds of myths that are going to be refuted in this book. Or, because we're running out of resources, government must manage them. Or, this one we hear quite a bit, actually. Equality serves the common good. Or, income inequality is the great economic and moral crisis of our time. Or, human rights are more important than property rights. Or, rich people have an obligation to give back. Health care is a right. We're destroying the earth and government must do something. All we need is the right people to run the government. Big government is a check on big business. Capitalism's sweatshops and child labor cry out for government intervention. And so on and so forth. And also about labor unions, although labor unions are kind of going out of fashion in the economy these days. But outsourcing... Uh, government has to subsidize the arts or historical preservation because the market won't do it. It's just objection after objection after objection, and you've got these pithy, very effective information and evidence-packed chapters for each one of these topics. How do you want to wrap this up today? Well, Tom, I would just say, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to talk about the book. And secondly, I would say that uh, what a great opportunity for people to send their college students off to school here uh, in a matter of days or weeks, uh, well armed to do intellectual battle with the progressive professors they're likely to have. That's the original purpose of this book, to, to provide in one volume uh, sufficient armament that uh, students could confidently do battle with progressive professors. I hope they'll have the courage to do so, and uh, if, the, if progressive professors have any integrity, they won't punish them for <laughs> for doing it, uh, but I know that's an all that's a never-ending problem. But people can order the book on Amazon. They can go to the fee f e e dot org website and just type in "excuse me, professor" and find uh, various ordering options. And uh, I hope uh, people will like it. Uh, leave a review of it on Amazon and spread the word about it. We'll have the Amazon link also at tomwoods.com slash 467. The book is Excuse Me, Professor, Challenging the Myths of Progressivism, edited by our guest today, Larry Reed. Larry, thanks again. Hey, thank you, Tom. I appreciate it. All right, everybody. Remember, I release a new episode Monday through Friday. So make sure and subscribe to the show. Get your free ebook, 14 Hard Questions for Libertarians Answered, by texting the word LIBERTY to 33444. Remember also the show notes page for today where you can get Larry's book is tomwoods.com slash 467. We're getting close to the homeschool decision that you have to make. What are you going to do for homeschooling this coming year? So please do consider the Ron Paul curriculum, but make sure you enter it through ronpaulhomeschool.com because I will give you a bunch of free bonuses, but only if you enter through that link. Get the details on today's show notes page, tomwoods.com slash 467. You'll see the wonderful goodies you get, but only if you join the site by first entering it through my link, ronpaulhomeschool.com. All the details are on the show notes page, tomwoods.com slash 467. we got a juicy debate coming up tomorrow on the question of Rand Paul for and against being debated here on the show tomorrow. I will just be moderating, minding my own business. I am sure you're going to enjoy tomorrow's episode. See you then. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.